how to arouse uh, motivation and energy for using the various techniques that cultivate awareness. Well, uh, you know, what, from my experience, when you, by following that, that pattern of Four Noble Truths, you know, you start, you begin to get this feeling of, of observing, and, and instead of just thinking about Dhamma, you, you're applying it, you're putting it, in, internalizing it. So you're not trying to define dukkha and get the proper English equivalent and, and who, what's the cause of dukkha and things like this as, as something intellectual and external when you, you start observing just like I became aware of just a, a sense that even when my life was all right, you know, a sense of anxiety or a kind of, uh, you know, that was not caused by anybody or anything. Just a, just a habit pattern of thinking and worrying about the future or, or self-consciousness, being concerned with what people think of me and things like this, or, you know, your own kind of personality, how it operates, and just where before I'd, I'd been more like psychotherapeutic about it, uh, I found that this way was was much more helpful rather than trying to, to make it into anything complicated, just to observe, just this general feeling of dis-ease or doubt, uncertainty, and, and also just to know what kind of character you have not to criticize it but to you know to be where 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 you kind of lose it where you where you're hurt the most where you're most vulnerable and, uh, and so you start taking an interest not in, in in a personal way but in this dhamma way and you begin to change from analyzing it on a personal level or a psychological level to seeing that uh, in terms of the rising, ceasing um, condition phenomena and and you're also more interested in in its cessation rather than trying to get rid of it, you know, trying to suppress it or run away you're, you're more, you, you know, you'll develop more kind of, kind of patience with even unpleasant mental states until they, and kind of bear with them until they naturally cease and then you, then you have, you, you get insight, these insights, the twelve insights through the Four Noble Truths. I found it, you know, it's sort of like a revelation because, you know, I, I saw, I always saw things too personally, took everything too, you know, my, I was a strong egotistical character and so everything was, was, uh, you know, made my life quite unbearable, not because of, of uh, anybody persecuting me particularly, but just, just these tendencies and obsessions around myself. And just that shift, if you notice like the personal truth, you, there is dukkha, there is suffering, and then uh, suffering should be understood. So that the, the first the first insight is uh, like a bariati dhamma. It's uh, it's just a statement. There is dukkha, and then the, then the second aspect is it should be understood, and then third is the insight it has been understood, and so that 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 sequence is all the four noble truths. Each truth has that that pattern of the three three aspects. And that's a, that is a reflective style. You know, it's not just stating what you should believe or uh, you agree or disagree with it. It's pointing to something that is quite easy to observe, suffering in yourself, and then that should be understood. How do you understand it? By analyzing it, blaming it on somebody or God or yourself or whatever. Or, in this way, it means changing from dismissing it or thinking about analyzing it to observing because uh, that's the Bhattipata so there's for each 
novel too, there's the Bariati Bati 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 and Bati Waiti. These are the Pali terms. And it's a it's like a paradigm or a pattern that is encourages us to reflect on something that is quite ordinary in, in anyone's life. And we're changing from just the the kind of personal reactions to suffering or ignoring it or suppressing it or blaming it to to observing it. And that's why it's a it's a noble truth because this when you think of it, what's noble about suffering? Because most of it is a, something none of us want, like or want. But it's it's like the sense of nobility, a sense of you changing from this kind of person blaming suffering on others or conditions to observing it. That's a shift. That's an important kind of um, quantum leap from worldly conditioning to Dhamma, to seeing things in terms of Dhamma rather than in, according to the way you're culturally programmed to see things. And like suffering tends to be, uh, you know, from in the Western world very much something that, you know, the, we've got this idea we should be happy and if there's if we're suffering there's something wrong with us we should go to a psychotherapist and take drugs or something get away from uh, and or you know people blame God and say you know how can you do this to me uh, you should have made everything nice for me and said you put a curse on my life that's one way there's nothing noble in that but you know when you think of an aria Satya or a noble truth is something in us that rises up in a more mature way to to look at suffering in terms of Dhamma rather than just the habitual reactions to discomfort, disease, fear and desire. And as you trust it more well, you know, the inside first it, you start out with the Bariati Dhamma, you know, with the there is suffering. Well that that kind of triggers it, you know, gives you the suggestion. But it's not a like a dogma you have to believe in. It's, you know, it's not like you have to believe in the person of the truth. It's just it's a pointing at, at something so ordinary in anyone's life. And then changing your re re response to it instead of reacting. You're, you're studying it, investigating it, looking at it. And then you, as you do that, you begin to see, you know, the, the sequence of how the habitual thinking process, we, we create, you know, we live in, in, a, in a deluded world, actually, the society. Uh, the, that's why the politics and economics are a mess, because everybody's deluded. Nobody knows what they're doing. So then, then you all have various views and opinions about how what government should be and, and uh, how what the economy should be and, and then have wars and it goes on endlessly in that vein. But this is like an awakening. So you can't, you know, you can't expect the government to do this. But, it, 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 but this is why it is it's, uh, to be known by oneself alone. Like budget time, where you see that for we need it. It's something you have to see for yourself. And as you begin to appreciate that, if you find it, you begin to trust it. Because you do begin to, you know, you're changing your attitude towards yourself, <coughs> towards the world, towards everything from just the ordinary reactive, you know, your own personal habitual emotional reactions to life, whatever they might be, or cultural biases or expectations. You're, you're, you're not trying to criticize that or make any, but, but, you, but being the observer of it. It's like, like mindfulness gives you the, putting it in terms like it, it, 
it opens this door to a kind of universal intelligence. You know, you, you know, we're conditioned when we're born, like a baby's born, and then you, then you're conditioned by first your mother. You know, she's the main influence in the beginning years of your life, and her feelings, her cultural attitudes, her identities, uh, and your family, your father, family, and social identity is instilled in those early years of, of childhood. And, and so you form your worldview from that. And, and then that tends to operate throughout your life, that basic conditioning. And, and the only way one can get out of it, and to see that conditioning, is not to find something else, other conditioning, but to observe it. And so, instead of being just a kind of conditioned person that's operating from, from, by a program that you didn't, didn't even ask for, <laughs> you start, you know, you start getting behind it. And it's like mindfulness is, a, is transcending the conditioning of your mind. And then you, you know, you begin to, once you, see that, you, you trust it more and more, because you think there's nothing else you can trust. Conditions, uh, you know, governments, politics, other people, we want to find somebody, another person we can put our trust in, and at the end of the day we become disappointed, and, and everything, you know, that we, we want to, to give us security will inevitably disappoint us, will fail us. And so, because that's the nature of this realm, it's just uh, incessant change, and, and there's no way you can make it the way you want it, but you can do this. And I found that, you know, by, by, by practicing with that over the years, because I caught on very quickly, and when I was, before I even met with Bonchard, with the Samanera, I did uh, almost a year of, of just uh, reflecting on these noble truths, and you know, I began to see, you know, what I began to get more confident how to use that rather than just, you know, see it from this Buddhist Buddhism or Buddhist teaching or Buddhist doctrine. Then, because it's very clear, it's, that it's a practical tool. It's not, not meant to be. Uh, metaphysical teaching or theory of any sort. So, so it's like a noble truth rather than an ultimate truth. But it's like the Buddha taking something so banal, so ordinary as dukkha, and then from that, from that kind of very ordinary experience, it takes you, if you follow the the Four Noble Truths pattern takes you to the path to deathless reality. And it, it you know, so it, it, but each truth has its, you know, like second and third Noble Truths are, are about the cause and the cessation. Well, I found, you know, like, like, like motions in there oftentimes arise just through conditions like anger, somebody can, somebody can do something that makes something and you just feel it, before you even know it, you feel it's anger. And then, uh, then you, then I began to, you know, I used to try to suppress anger and uh, try to, you know, push it away or, or take it too quickly, feel like I shouldn't be angry. Uh, anger is a personal weakness and something wrong. <laughs> well, in, in other words, then, then I began to just, through the noble truth and through this uh, reflection on the dependent origination, I began to see anger no longer as such a, as something personal when the conditions for anger arise, and this is what you feel. 
and even uh, in like something like that arises very quickly at that point where you suddenly beware you're feeling angry like this they can cut the chain cut the the momentum of that habit right at that point with mindfulness because you suddenly instead of like suppressing it trying to deny it or believe it and just follow it those are the two extremes but this way you, even though you even if you you know say something tell somebody off in anger or hit them there's always a point where you suddenly realize and that point is that actually in an awakened state you suddenly realize the anger and then, then not to see it in terms of some kind of personal defect because then you're making it more than what it actually is <clears throat> but trusting your mindfulness of it, it feels like this is anger is a strong emotion you feel it in your body it's hot it's <clears throat> you know exciting and things like this so you can it's easy to recognize but <clears throat> then the ones that are I found like uh, my big my big uh, obstruction was doubt I'm a real doubter and uh, so I you know ang- I get angry I have lust and things like that but they had the Lopa do, Dosa Moha you know I, I contemplated these three greed, hatred and delusion and I decided well I think my biggest problem is delusion <laughs> and so I I really took an interest in it and then, then like uh, my early acquaintance before I came into the Theravada world was through Zen Japanese Zen which I never practiced but I I thought, you know, I've read a lot of that kind of literature. And, uh, of course, they use doubt a lot in the koan, and deliberately use, make yourself, throw yourself into a state of uncertainty and doubt quite intentionally. And uh, and then you begin to, uh, you this mindfulness practice, you begin to observe this feeling of uncertainty, doubt, is like this. You can begin to to recognize it, this kind of confusing, foggy feeling of insecurity, doubt, and and then you change from being someone who, who claims doubt as your personal problem to being one who uses doubt as a as a way of, of investigating the noble truth. So that's why you know each one of us is has our own particular common to deal with. You know, I mean, not, the Four Noble Truths is a nice, neat pattern that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, but it's not meant to be like a, only one way of doing it, you know, where the way I've done it is the way you should do it, but it's, a, it's taking something like dukkha that we all have experience and how to, how to change from running away, blaming, reacting to it, to, to using it. And, and then you, and Ajahn Chah was, was always very praising people who, monks who develop their own upayas or skillful means. And sometimes, you know, you have to, that's why you have to really observe, not critically observe yourself, but observe the references, tendencies, uh, obsessions, not to not to make any judgment but so you can actually see them in terms of mental objects rather than as personal problems and then it you know over the years you apply that to whatever's happening in your life so uh, you know like the story is about establishing what <laughs> You know, having this. I like solitude. I like going off in the kuti and practicing alone, and then suddenly I'm head of a community. And that brings up certain 
anxieties and fears and doubts. But then the point is to be able to use that while you're on the job. You know, I don't have to run away to the forest to do it in. But like in the middle of it, in the middle of a of a storm, you you begin to observe it rather than just run away from it. And they had this one of these Tibetan. They, I mean, I remember seeing this like a it says a, a lotus blooming in the midst of an inferno is indestructible. Then you have this picture of this inferno, this fire, and then this lotus flower in the middle of this inferno, you know, so then, then you contemplate, you know, a lotus is a, is a delicate thing, you know, and the inferno is very strong, you know, hot, and destructive, and powerful, and then in the middle of this is this lotus, which is very delicate. And so then, uh, I use this as a reminder that sometimes you find yourself in the in the midst of an inferno. I mean, a lot of a lot of you know confusing things, demands, and that come your way. And then, then, but something like that, I'd remember that lotus in the midst of all that. And that's mindfulness to me. The lotus is like. Uh, I would equate with mindfulness to indestructible. And no matter what the inferno going on outside, mindfulness is, is indestructible. And then you begin to trust that and develop and cultivate it. After a while, the mindfulness becomes more like a, a con- continuity. At first, it's just more like flashes or insights, and then you're back into the old pattern, but as you begin to to appreciate this and trust this, then you find that you know mindfulness is ability to to stay with something as it arises and ceases, it's no matter whether it's a subtle or coarse condition. So then, the developing the path is more like samadhi. The fourth noble truth is. If, you know, if, when somebody did right understanding, you have this right understanding, and then it, it should be developed. So the insight into the fourth noble truth is bhavana, uh, practice, develop, cultivate, you know. So then you you determine to, to cultivate that, no matter what's happening. So then, like, I was here two years, and then I went went to to England, and, and I, then I made that my priority. This mindfulness is a priority, because here I was going, you know, to a situation I didn't know, and and my nature, my personal tendency would be to worry and anticipate and create all kinds of possible <coughs> scenarios of success and failure and and that on a personal level my mind proliferates and that's very worried about failing. So I had to make this, you know, this strong this determination, the lotus in the midst of the inferno, mindfulness, no matter what, if, you know, they're torturing you or nailing you to a cross or burning the stake, I would be mindful. <laughs> and, you know, nothing like that ever happened, but you're in, you know, you're really challenged a lot. There's, you be, you be recognize, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, both from external and by your own personal tendencies and habits, fears. But it's all past knowledge. Once you trust it, you can use whatever, whatever happens to you.